Hello, everybody, and thank you for enabling us to come here, and, and uh, thank to you to come here uh, to listen to Sanjana. On behalf of Serge Dro, who is, is here, Sanjana, of course, myself, and some other colleagues, I, I warmly welcome to the session. ICT for Peace is an action-oriented think tank. It goes back to 2004, where we, the group, were thinking about what could information society, which is so beneficial to our society and business and, and social affairs, do for peace and peaceful purposes. And that's for us early on where we looked at technology from dumb phone, smartphone, over to internet, um, satellite, drones, now AI, how can we use uh, and use technology for peaceful purposes. And you uh, will not go into the details, but you can see that on the website. But then, very soon in 2007-8, we saw that the cyberspace was challenged. Challenged because of criminals, hooligans, hackers, but also by states, who used the cyberspace for strategic purposes. So we got into this second area of work. How can we create a global system of norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace for states. Of course, in cooperation with the private sector, which of course is only managing the underlying uh, <laughs> system and networks. And then thirdly, another layer of complexity now, and that's what Sanjana will talk about mostly, but others too, is the new phenomenon on misinformation, disinformation, Hate, hate speech, fake news, that is there, brought to us, again, as a society, based on social media. And now, of course, as we have seen, uh, governments, the business also is struggling how to get the genie back into the bubble. So this is what we do. I thank you very much, and I hand over to Sandrana, and uh, thank you again for coming. You want your notebook? Good evening, everybody. What a, what, a, what a privilege to speak here. It's a fantastic building. I've spoken at ETH before, but I've never actually come in here. It's gorgeous. The architecture is so beautiful, and what a privilege for the students here to study in, uh, in, in this kind of building, uh, which I think promotes learning. It's quite extraordinary, really, uh, and how lucky I am to come and speak here. I'm going to spend about an hour, really, taking you through a journey, and I hope we have some discussions and conversation afterwards. What I usually do is to present a pastiche, snapshots for conversation, in the hope that the underlying things and principles and ideas and philosophy of what I may present, just snapshots of, uh, is that which we have a conversation around. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm doing my PhD in Dunedin at the University of Otago. And by complete coincidence, because I also come from Sri Lanka, I have found myself enmeshed, embroiled, embraced by the emotional tsunami of both the terrorism in Christchurch, which was extraordinary, and also what happened in my own country. And I can assure you that doing a PhD on social media when these two events have happened is the most difficult thing imaginable because you're supposed to academically divorce yourself from the emotional contagion uh, that pulls you in to the vortex that is both home and what happens where I'm studying. So essentially to give you a foundation in terms of the perspectives that I'll present, what I do is to look at social media at scale. And at scale means somewhat more in depth and uh, in, a, in a more varied way than you would go through your own social media accounts every day in a manner that I've set up for academic rigor and study I look at just over a thousand Facebook accounts these are accounts that have been in academic parlance called purposively sampled they're not pulled out of thin air these are accounts that are clustered into political parties, politicians, extremist groups, individuals, 
those in power, those out of power, those who want to come into power, those who have a voice and those who want a voice more than they have at present. So there are about 25 different clusters that I look in. Uh, these these 1,000 Facebook accounts. I also look at an equivalent number of accounts over Twitter. Uh, again, these are clustered according to um, the categories that Facebook is clustered in. So every single day, basically, this is what I go through and have a way in which I ascertain and glean things from this around 2,000 data set that interests me and that are happening in real time. I also look at Instagram, about 500 accounts but that is just out of personal interest, not really relevant to my PhD. And this is, I mean, familiar, I suppose, for those of you who may be familiar with a sea, I mean, being an island country, I grew up five minutes away from a, from a wonderful beach. But if you take Sri Lanka, and this is not applicable everywhere in the world, this is why I study Facebook and Twitter. In my country, Facebook is the vector, the platform where everything from gossip and dating and family matters and family debates and family discussions through to friends and politics and commerce and industry happens. But it happens in my language, in Sinhalese, only spoken in Sri Lanka. And that is relevant, which is why I mention it. Uh, about 95% of the discourse and content generation on Facebook happens in my language. So if you were to look at Facebook in Sri Lanka, you would see only a sliver of the conversational depth and rigor that there is on the platform. So in a sense, that's like the sea. That's where the vast body of content is. The ephemerality of Twitter is also interesting because Twitter is also quite large in Sri Lanka, but in a different way. Twitter gives a hint of what's to come. If you take a look at and analyze Twitter in Sri Lanka, it always refers back to Facebook. All the links, or the majority of the links says, look here, I'm putting something on Twitter, but for more information, go to Facebook. Yeah? So it's outward facing, but it links back to, uh, to Facebook, whereas Facebook is inward looking. So, Twitter in the country is not as important as Facebook, but for those looking at the country, Twitter is important because it gives you a, a, a rough understanding of what's happening um, at any given point of time. Now, both of these shape public opinion in the short term. Whenever something happens, something good or bad, like a suicide bomb, like an election, like a referendum, like an electoral campaign, like something somebody said, like a festivity, like a celebration, the opinion of the public is increasingly and predominantly now shaped and informed and influenced by these two platforms. Now there's a particular demographic that is linked to these platforms, but the footprint, the influence, the impact of the platforms is much larger than those just who are connected to it which is something that many people don't understand. So the impact is larger than the numbers just participating on these platforms in terms of an account. And our concern, my concern, a few of us are concerned, not the government clearly, that the long-term impact of what is now being engineered is being done with a view to shift and change and morph and merge public opinion in a particular way so that certain actors and certain politicians and certain political parties have advantage. This is the art of the long game. This is five years down the future, ten years down the future. This is not the next election. There are electoral strategies that, as Daniel said, use misinformation to kind of shift public opinion in the short term, but also our concern is that it has an impact over the longer term. My, my son, for example, is 12. He's already on certain social media. And his, his mother and I already are seeing how his mind, his perceptions of society, his perceptions of friendship, his perceptions of a different community are being slightly influenced and informed by what he's connected to. So this is, this is the reality. So in my thesis, I hope to call it the evolution from the sea to the sand, which is the ephemeral, to the shore, which is the short term, to the soil, which is the landmass over the longer term. So this is the journey, in a sense, 
of information. So in Christchurch, just to go very briefly, I'm sure being a literate audience, you know what happened. Um, extraordinary time to be in New Zealand, unprecedented event. And for um, what the country went through, I don't know whether there are any Kiwis in the audience, um, but it's an extraordinary template for uh, a country's response to an act of terrorism. So a, a, a rather large de uh, death toll, um, but also very interesting things that happened as a consequence, which we can talk about a bit later. Easter Sunday, I don't know how much Sri Lanka makes the news in this part of the world, but if you just take a look at those dead, right, dwarfs, Christchurch. If you take a look at um, search interest or news interest or newsworthiness on the number of reports, and you compare not the dance burning with Christchurch and Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka actually comes last. So people are not very interested in the kind of disaster that it had. But it, for this kind of toll, uh, has an impact in the country for a variety of reasons that I can go into later on. But it's, a, it's geographically uh, a small country, so this kind of toll, I mean, the, the explosions happen bo in, bo in, in, in both Colombo as well as the East Coast. So the, the resonance of that, of that violence was coast to coast. Uh, so it did have a, a, a significant impact on the country that's celebrating 10 years after the end of the war in 2009, almost to the date. So what I do is to look at, you know, a, f a few years ago when Hillary Clinton was, when Obama was in power, Hillary Clinton gave a speech at Museum, which is a museum dedicated to news in Washington, D.C. And I mean, already many years ago with typical American hootspah said that social media was the pulse of the world. Apologies for the American <coughs> audience. And it was complete bollocks at the time. Um, social media at the time would, could, would have been the pulse of America, but it wasn't the pulse of the world. But things have changed in the past six or seven years, where now social media, particularly in countries like mine and Myanmar, give you a sense, a hint, an indication that something is going on. It's like the doctor with a stethoscope look, uh, hearing your heartbeat. Or, or feeling your pulse by holding your arm. So I look at signatures and signals and signs at the scale I'm looking at, uh, which allows me a unique perspective into the context of a country. Um, so let's go into, for example, one snapshot. So Sri Lanka had a 30-year-old war, which ended almost exactly 10 years ago. So most of my adult life has not been in a country at peace. Um, after the end of the war, however, one of the things that's happened or not in the country is that we haven't really had a conversation about why the hell the war took place. Wars don't just happen overnight. You don't wake up and because of a bad hair day go to war that lasts 30 years. The problem is that we haven't had that conversation. Now, it's one thing for me to say it, it's another thing for the data to say it. So there are two, for those of you who don't know, on Twitter you use hashtags, and there are two key hashtags that capture the end of the war. Every year after 2009, we've had these two hashtags uh, on the 18th and 19th of May, capturing the conversations around the end of the war. Now this is what happened just a few days ago. So. Victory Days is, in a sense, the hashtag that is used by the south of the country, by one community. And if you examine, and this is in terms of the thousands of tweets, um, you won't be able to understand any of the top words used because they are all in my language. This is pertinent in the next slide. So those words are basically around treating the army as heroes, they are about the army, um, and they are about the various sections of the army, so the Air Force, the Navy, and the police, uh, and they are thankful, so there is a lot of gratitude in those words. And then if you examine the emojis used in these tweets, also you can see a lot of uh, thankfulness or gratitude, there's a Sri Lankan flag, they are loving the army, they find the army strong, there's a bit of sadness. Um, but basically, there's a, there's, a, there's a certain emotional uh, anchor there. Now, if you take this, which is 
I won't go too much into the detail to bore you, but this is the place, the geographic location where the war ended, and it ended in a very, very brutal way, by the way. That's why the country is divided. So in Mulik Baikal, which is the hashtag used, um, you'll see that there's a lot of, almost all the words are in English. And here, the, the content is fundamentally different to the earlier one. So there's a lot of remembrance here, there's Tamils, um, there's uh, a yearning for justice, there's a remembrance of those killed, and also in terms of not forgetting the victims of conflict. So a completely different conversational domain. And even though the emoticons look the same, in fact there's a lot more sadness uh, in, in the emoticons used. Now this is just a snapshot on just one platform at scale to suggest that as recently as a few days ago, you had one country with two completely different narratives about the end of the war. There is no connection between the two. You, the data does not suggest, just by looking at the data and from the scientists in the room, if I presented the data without a name, you will say that these are from two different countries, that they are not even in the same geographic territory. That is a problem. And that is the problem that you see very clearly through data, in a sense of a country at war with itself still, even though the war ended in terms of a physical reality or a kinetic reality 10 years ago. How does social media fit into this? So I'll give you a snapshot about what you can glean out of social media. But what we call it, I mean, these are all fancy terms. At the end of the day, it basically means that social media plays a role in weaponizing this, in exacerbating this. And that's the narrative that NZZ and the New York Times and WAPO and all of the Western media are, are, are so interested in as a consequence of seeing Facebook as evil incarnate. There is this predominant now interest in seeing the worst of social media. And in a sense, that's true. So you have this dual edge between the democratic potential and also now increasingly the Democlean reality of social media, particularly in countries where there is what you would call a democratic deficit, which is the polar opposite to Switzerland. Sri Lanka is not Switzerland, New Zealand may be. But in countries like Myanmar and in many countries in South and Southeast Asia, Central Africa and, and other, other contexts, you have this kind of social media in social and political and economic and cultural and communal volatility. So there are a couple of things that, that define the difference today. So people are always asking, so what's new? You know, probably had these conversations with our grandfathers were listening to radio for the first time, or when television came about, or when the newspapers came about. So what's new? Yes, of course, these are old problems and old challenges, and our grand, great grandchildren will probably be talking about synaptic you know, things in their heads that connect them wirelessly to the internet or whatever the head is going to be called 20 or 30 years down the line. So they are enduring conversations. But right now, you talk about three things. You talk about the volume, which is the, the sheer mass of content. You talk about the vector, which is how you engage with the content. And you talk about the velocity, the speed with which this content is being created. So there is the scale, how big is the kind of content that is being created. The scope, how vast is it, how quickly is it spreading, and amongst whom, and by whom is it being spread by. And the speed, is it happening quickly? Is it happening at the speed of your thumb, or does it, does it take longer? And uh, these are things that have changed significantly with the introduction of social media. And the greatest example of it, probably you read about it as well, is this still image. Now, in, in, in New Zealand, um, this is for a still frame from the, the live video that the, the killer broadcast as he went around his killing spree, the video itself. Uh, and the killer's document are now banned in New Zealand. You can get special uh, permission as an academic to study them, but you can't have them uh, even uh, as uh, uh, files on your personal computer. This is, a, this is an image, this is a video, this is a live broadcast that went viral. And that was one story. Um, the killer knew what he was doing. I think it was a GoPro camera. It was connected. And um, 
for academic purposes, I watched this video, it's absolutely horrific. It is because I have, I'm not normal, and my entire life has been spent, in a sense, along with my generation in conflict, that I can bear watching this. I would very strongly recommend against watching it, if you can find it, because it is brutal. It is absolutely horrible. It's a, it's, it's a first-person perspective of a killing screen. Why did this go viral? The killer knew what he was doing. The killer knew exactly what he was doing. In fact, the killer knew so well what he was doing that this is probably one of the most social media savvy mass murders and massacres in history. So it went viral on, on many, many channels. Um, YouTube couldn't deal with it. At one point of time, soon after it happened on the ground, YouTube was dealing with one video upload. These are mirror, mirror copies per second on its platform. Now, this resulted in uh, YouTube taking unprecedented measures to stop it. This is the first time in the history of the company that it has done it because it simply couldn't stop it from spreading. So they stopped searching for recent uploads and they relied entirely on algorithms. If it was even remotely identified by YouTube to be part of the Christchurch Killers videos, it was deleted and it was taken off the platform, which of course meant that there was content that was taken off what you call false positives as well, but they just didn't have the human capacity for oversight over the kind of content that was spreading. Um, there is a lot now already being written about this. One is the kind of virality that it generated on YouTube, and the other is just the degree to which the killer knew how to weaponize social media. It's extraordinary. The killer knew exactly what to say, what to do, and if you read the killer's document, which is I think around 78 pages long, um, it's obviously filled with hate and white supremacist ideology, but it's also very social media savvy. It's geared to be shared. There are even insider jokes um, around what he's doing and what compels him to do it, which you will only understand if you're from a particular generation, and you will only understand if you use certain platforms. Uh, so it's extraordinary the degree to which the killer knew how to weaponize social media. So what you, would, what you call this is an accelerant for infamy. Social media today, for many, has become a problem because of its interplay with contexts that have a democratic deficit or for terrorists like we had in Christchurch. Now, in my country, which is very different to New Zealand, what you have is a several decades of violence on the ground, of communal violence, of racism, uh, of marginalization and of political violence and electoral violence. And over this month, which has been probably the longest month in my life, you know, it's been very, very hard because almost every day you've had some kind of violence on the ground after the 21st of April. So when political science or sociology um, studies mob violence, we tend to look at why a crowd <coughs> gathers. I mean, it doesn't happen in Zurich. Doesn't happen in Switzerland. Doesn't happen in New Zealand. Mobs suddenly don't gather and go killing people and burning things. So, what are the conditions that allow mobs like that to gather? So, here you have maybe some lessons from nature. Nobody quite understands what you are seeing. This is called murmuration. This is when a large group of birds come together and form a flock and fly in this fashion. You see the same kind of dynamic, behavioral dynamics with large shoals of fish in the ocean. You really don't know why it's happening. It's actually gorgeous to look at if you've ever seen it in real life. But this shape, this form, this leaderless, leaderless structure is really quite complex. It's so complex that you have not figured out actually how it works. But Part of it is because it, of this phenomenon called collective intelligence. Um, it's the intelligence of the group. There's no one leader. It's everybody acting and behaving in a particular context that gives rise to that kind of structure. So that you see it in the natural world, but you also see it in the political and social world as well. Um, 
and it's different to the kind of political structure that you would have, say, in an election, where you vote for somebody and you know who the leader or leaders are. That kind of swarm is leaderless. It's, it's, it's morphing, it's fluid. And it's based on three well, general principles. One is addition. But how you stick on to something? Is there an ideology? Is there a, is there a thing that arrests your attention that you'd like to be part of? Young people, for example, find um, certain ideologies very, very um, exciting to be part of. Peer pressure, for example. Cohesion is the, the internal dynamics of it. How do you gather as a group? So one is latching on to something. The other is how do you form yourself as a group? And the third principle is repulsion. How do you keep from in a swarm like that crashing into it, everybody. So, I mean, a visual always helps. Uh, here you see two, the, two, uh, the two first principles, addition and cohesion together. So the water, the water droplets on a leaf, um, in terms of physics, conform to both addition and cohesion. They are on the leaf because they are, they, they are latched on to the little, little microfibers on the leaf surface. But the bubble is formed by the physical properties of water. Um, you also see in terms of magnetic attraction and repulsion. So if you take a look at those little iron filings, very often society also organizes it at, itself at scale based on what you might see a magnet do with those little iron filings. Now, a lot of this is also dependent on context, country, and community. This is why it's such a hard science. This is why you can't say simply, as many do, that just the mere introduction of social media increases the proclivity to violence. It has never happened. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, the reason why this happened in the past two weeks in Sri Lanka, and this is a recent photo, we've had widespread island-wide mobs, uh, including just on Monday last week, where we had the worst communal riots in the history, in a, in a very long time in the history of the country, um, happen because of these scientific principles enmeshed with the kind of political social dynamics in the country. The point about this, and I want to stress this, is that when you're studying social media in contexts like this, you can't reduce it to just an argument that suggests, and as many do, that just Facebook alone or Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp increases violence. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, you can't reduce complex systems to simple drivers. But you can look at artificial intelligence as an accelerant to violence. So there are, there are reasons to think that this is a problem. YouTube, for example, I don't know how many of you use it in the room. It's already old media in one sense. Um, is a problem. It has been academically studied to suggest that what they call the recommendation engine, every time you finish a video, there's another one recommended for you. And this is like tumbling down the rabbit hole in Alice in Wonderland. Uh, YouTube is trying very hard to fix this, but up until last year, it was a problem because it, for example, if you were studying radicalization and you went to content that was slightly radical, it increasingly got more radical in its recommendations. So quite extraordinary, actually. And even though there's a special version of YouTube for children, the concern is that at the young demographic in the United States, there's a very high percentage of just the, um, the sixth or seventh recommended video being entirely age inappropriate. So this is a recommendation engine that increasingly gets more violent, gets more um, ideologically hardened, and also recommends things that children should not really be looking at. You also have problems around limitations. People sometimes tend to, tend to think of AI as this panacea. Everything's going to be better because of AI. You know, my talk is not about AI, but about a specific aspect of AI, which is about interpreting, uh, inter uh, interpretation and context, and this technical term called hashing. How so, I mean, very simply, how social media companies deal with terrorist uh, content is they put a unique signature, like a code, like a barcode, on every photo or video or frame of the video that is 
determined to be terrorist content. So if in the future somebody uploads that same video, it's deleted and blocked at the point of upload. And it also makes it very easy in a way to kind of look into that entire network and delete that content across the board. Now, there are limitations to this. And the, one of the best examples was, this is a, a, a screenshot of um, live footage that was around the Notre Dame fire. And extraordinary, YouTube thought that it was linked to the 9-11 attacks in America. And that was what it recommended as context. Right. So this actually happened. It was a big boo-boo for YouTube because they were just coming out of Christchurch and saying, they're going to fix this, and then this happened. Which clearly says so just that, you know, that, that, I mean, it's quite literally, I'm not making this up, humans don't quite understand now how the algorithms work because they've got so sophisticated. So there's a real problem around these companies. Now, for you, it probably takes at most one second to figure out what this is. Right? For AI, it's nearly impossible. If you present this to AI in terms of image classification, it does not know what the hell it's looking at. And in fact, there's a lot of academic research done. Um, I couldn't get the screenshots for it, but um, what you would see as an orange with just a few pixels off, like just a few little pixel, little pixelation, for AI it becomes a screwdriver. Right? For you, it's an orange, but for AI and image analysis, it becomes a screwdriver. So this is a problem, because if AI can't determine at scale the kind of content being put onto this platform, how on earth is it going to take off this content? Now this to you is a cat, but it's not a cat. It's not a cat. It's a combination of images in the likeliness of a cat, and the, the cat is made out of, of cat images as well. Right? AI doesn't know what to do with this. Think of all of those photos as terrorist content. Now, each of those images may be banned on the platform, but when you combine them in a form that gives it this kind of um, frame, uh, it is a visual representation of how you can cheat AI. And these are real practical problems that very intelligent minds, far more intelligent than I myself, are trying to grapple with. But right now, there is no solution to this. And even in the near future, there is no solution to this. So there's also stuff around machine learning and what's called natural language parsing or processing. So I don't know how many of you followed Mark Zuckerberg's testimony to Congress. Mark Zuckerberg, last year, in around March, when he testified to Congress, said that he's going to fix it. In fact, he's been saying he's going to fix it for quite some time. He's still trying to fix it. But one of the things he said that is going to help him fix it, and by it meaning Facebook, was as a consequence of what the hell happened in Burma, where Facebook was implicated in a genocide. It's not a joke. Right? And that is why, in addition to Cambridge Analytica, he was called up in Congress. Now, one of the things he said is that we are working on it because we are going to work on the ways through which Facebook is going to understand what you're going to type. Right. This is my Facebook. And this is me typing in my language. Now keep in mind I said earlier that my language is only spoken in my country and it's the same in Myanmar as well. Burmese is only spoken in Myanmar and Burma, nowhere else in the world. Now, what's the problem there? Swiss German, German, French, Arabic, English, Chinese have a large corpus of texts that you can pull from for many, many years in the public domain that you can use to train the kind of things called machine learning algorithms that Facebook would use to determine what is being said. Now, when I put this up, in fact, this says, my country is very beautiful. Facebook struggles in a bit to understand whether I'm actually calling for somebody to be beheaded and calling for them to be killed, or whether I'm actually saying my country is beautiful. Right? Now, this is text, even though this is a screenshot, this is text, I've actually typed this in. This is not text, even though it looks like text. This is a huge problem, but what's the problem here? This is an image of a particularly famous place in my country, and a beautiful one at that. It's actually a rock fortress. It's one of the most ancient rock fortresses in the world, um, and you can climb it. The sentence at the end says, my country is very beautiful, but uh, screw anybody who likes ice cream. 
in ruder way. Right? Now, the problem is that Facebook cannot read that text. Because why? It's an image. And this is the problem with a lot of the content in my part of the world, where text is embedded into a photo, which makes it machine unreadable. They're called cartoons or memes. So a lot of the hate content on these platforms in my part of the world, in my language, which Facebook already struggles with, is distributed through this form, which makes it almost impossible at the present moment to stop or control or curtail, much less respond to. Right? Because it's an image with text, and Facebook doesn't have an idea of what to do with it. There's also another problem called context conflation. When you look at Facebook, I mean, you don't think about it, for those of you who are on Facebook, but I mean, these are screenshots of the New York Times from Trump, from Fox, from Breitbart, and from CNN. And the problem is that they all look the same. The New York Times, if you pick it up as a physical copy, would, would, would look very different to the Reader's Digest, would look very different to Newsweek or Time magazine, because it looks different, it feels different. But on Facebook, everything looks the same. Academics call this context conf uh, conflation. In a country like mine, which has a very high adult literacy, so lots of people read and write, but a very poor media literacy, people don't critically question what they consume, rumor and misinformation are believed to be true because they look like things that you would associate with having credible information, because it all looks the same on the news feed. This is, again, a big problem. Now, I can talk more about what you probably know and fear and read in NZZ and other newspapers, but I want to give you the flip side, which is why it's so hard for us in our countries. We have to deal with this bloody problem. We have to deal with this uh, social media phenomenon. So what's the flip side? So in New Zealand, for example, and as I said, as a consequence of being there, I studied it quite in depth. Um, there's a phenomenon, one of the ways in which you can study uh, Twitter is something called hashtag co-occurrence. What does that mean? Now it's too, it's too small for you to see this, actually. It's actually a super high resolution image. This image is about 50 megabytes, so you can, it's like an image of, a, of the solar system or the Milky Way. You can, it's literally like a constellation. It's not different to the constellation you would see when you look up at the night sky. Every dot there is a hashtag. And this is the conversation around the attack, a weak input. And by looking at the kind of hashtags that have been associated in with the attack and in response to it, you get an understanding of what the dynamic of the conversation is. Is it hateful? Is it spiteful? Is it hurting? Is it sad? Is it angry? Is it loving? Is it responding in a humane way? Or is it calling for the execution of the killer. What kind of conversation? Like a supermarket labor. When you go to a supermarket, like Migro or Coop, you see labels on the aisle. So you know that if you want a deodorant or if you want uh, vegetables, you go to a particular aisle. And when you go to the aisle, you get to select. It's just like that. A hashtag would give you an indication of what the content is. And he here's what's interesting. Here's what's extraordinary. After the attack in March in Christchurch, the a week in, it was not violent, it was not venomous. People didn't want the killer's head. It was all about love, and it was all about the values of decency and dignity and democracy that New Zealand should uphold and not give in to terrorism. So it's quite extraordinary. I also look at what people were talking about in terms of this visualization. There were two uh, hashtags called 49 Lives, which was uh, done by an American professor in America. And there was uh, this hashtag called They Are Us, uh, done by actually a popular Hollywood actor who also happens to be uh, a Kiwi resident in New Zealand. He was the guy who came in Jurassic Park, the, the first one, as the doctor. I forget his name now. But he's Kiwi and he lives in the country and he started this hashtag called They Are Us. They meaning the Muslims are us. 49 lives referring to initially what the death toll was, 49 dead. And you looked at the kind of conversation around this, and again, you found people coming together. People wanting to know the names of those who were killed and not about the killer, and the values of New Zealand. Again, quite an extraordinary conversation that brought people together, wasn't determined by hate, hurt, or harm. And I wrote about this. I wrote about this and the data that I saw, 
And Twitter used this in a briefing I was told much later on with the New Zealand government because this then, and to my knowledge and to theirs, still is to date the only article that looks at social media at scale in a positive way in response to Christchurch. So not saying that it was all bad like I showed you earlier, but looking at how Twitter brought together people from around the world. So some of the, 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 the most in-depth conversations extraordinarily happened in Pakistan and India on Christchurch. Because some of the victims were from those countries and some of the victims' names were first revealed by very popular people in those countries. So there was a conversation around Christchurch happening in India and Pakistan, again very loving, saying that they were so sad that this happened, and solidarity and support and sadness. Now, again, late last year, I know, you know, it's so exhausting to give a talk about Sri Lanka because I, it's my, it's home, I love it, you know, I, mean, I want to die in it. But it's also a country which just doesn't seem to get out of cycles of violence. And it, I hate talking about the country in this kind of way, but I must, because this is a very inter interesting example. So late last year, how do I even explain this? The current president, who ran against the former president with the red uh, thing there, so this is the former president, this is the current president. In 2015, the current president ran against him. It was, a, it was, it was quite a, a significant election. Um, and, you know, the, 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 two are, the two are not friends. I mean, this is oppositional politics, right? It's a high stakes game, winner takes all game. On the 26th of October 2018, the current president invited him to become the Prime Minister. Overnight. Extraordinary. I can't explain any, any, any more beyond that because it's, it still befuddles us. And plunged the country into chaos. And one of the things that happened, that's a longer story, is that all state media was taken over. Violently. Mobs went to state media and took over print and television stations. Literally took it over. Hammered everybody in it got rid of them and then uh, took it over. As a consequence, my parents in the country didn't know what was going on. Uh, people didn't know what was going on. So it's typical coup dynamics where the normalization of the coup has to happen very quickly. So I looked at how social media became a lifesaver, a democratic force in the country. I looked at nearly f uh, half a million tweets over 2018 and even if you didn't know anything about the country, um, there's months on that side and there's the day of the week, you'll see that in November, something is happening that is making people tweet more. Because those blogs, it's like the blood samples are, are larger. Each little dot or blog there is an account. So I look at it at scale in terms of tens of millions or tens of thousands, but I can also go into a particular account. So I, I, I know it's, it's quite powerful the way that I, I gather the data. So I can look into a particular account and then see what it's been saying and over which period of time, but I can also look at it at scale. And without knowing anything, you know that something is happening in November. What's happening? People are talking about it. People are angry about it. People are fighting against it. This is also the two political parties. And you can see in green that the, the political party which was deposed, which was unconstitutionally, the prime minister of that political party who was unconstitutionally taken out of power, the engagement around that political party astronomically grew astronomically grew because people on Facebook were angry about it. Not necessarily party followers, party political, uh, party, you know, Carter, but a lot of people were concerned about the future of democracy. So I wanted to find a way in which I could capture this for my son. How could he, when he was an adult like us, you know, see this period of the country? Because at the time, we weren't sure what the hell was going to happen to the country. So. What I did was I used a way in which I pulled down tens of thousands of images from the weeks of discussion over Twitter and I created online an image that is 20 feet by 20 feet. So some, someday I want to print it and put it up in a public square in Colombo. And you know this is what we would call the gigapixel image and it's a, a pastiche of the kind of conversations that occurred around a particular hashtag linked to the pushback against the coup. Uh, so that was coup.lk, this was hashtag LKA. So all of those are little, little images off Twitter. These are things that people have posted, by the way. Um, and 
and it kind of gives an understanding of our people. So every little image sometimes is a message of, of resistance, of democracy, of standing up against authoritarianism. Uh, and then I put this up and then became a way for people to understand that there was a very large community of people for democracy. We looked at um, the kind of things that people were talking about on Twitter because this is the only platform that is available to them and it was a lot of pro-democracy content, nothing about the normalization of the coup. People were fighting, fighting tooth and nail to make sure that democracy was restored. And then you also had memes or cartoons. Now you won't understand this because it only resonates locally. And well, one of them actually is from uh, Fast and Furious. Um, but a lot of this actually went viral. It was shared uh, incredibly widely at the time. Um, and in a country where this kind of content um, has great appeal and attraction because it's easy to share, people understand it, you don't need to write anything down. So this kind of content in the hundreds of thousands was also shared on social media as a pushback against authoritarianism creep. And by the way, the, the rightful Prime Minister was restored back into power in, in mid-December. What happened after the suicide attacks on the 21st of April? So you would think that a suicide attack which killed, you know, 250 people would result in immediately anger and hate, you know, you know this, 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 this visceral kind of interest in getting back at those who are responsible. But this is an image of Christ, and I mean, it's hard to say, but, or hard to talk about it, but, you know, Christ here is literally covered in the blood of the victims, right? This is from a church that was bombed. It's hard to look at. Um, uh, some of these churches don't have the roof, I mean, it's extraordinary, I mean, the, the power of these blasts. And this tweet was 24 hours after the one tweet that was the most popular on Twitter. And it's not calling for, it's not calling for violence. There's a very different message. Likewise, this tweet was the second most popular. As you can imagine, uh, Sri Lanka ran out of blood for the victims. So there's an open call for blood donations. The, the response to the call was so great that by the end of Sunday, the blood bank asked people not to come. Because foreigners and Muslims and everybody went to donate blood. It was the largest, single greatest blood donation campaign in the history of the country. Nobody stayed away. And the way in which that was spread also was through social media. You don't need to know the figures, but that peak that you see there, is on the 22nd of April for Twitter. It's the highest increase in a 24-hour period of tweets in the country in the, in the history of the platform. That is how much people use social media to kind of respond immediately to what was happening. This is a visualization of all the conversations after a week, so the 21st of April to the 28th, around particular hashtags linked to the suicide attacks. That green section you see there, which is a very large section, is essentially talking about uh, capturing accounts that were tweeting about the attack, but in a very reconciliatory, peaceful way. They were using Twitter to bring people together. So this is what I mean. This is about 500,000 tweets, graphically visualized to showcase that the response over social media to violence was not more violence. Right. And that this is also very important. There were also memes, so all of this was spread. This is all, you won't understand it, but it's all calling for restraint, for calm, um, for non-violence. Um, and these are two examples, along with many other examples, that, that I want to leave you with because it's not simple for us. Social media is a driver of violence but it's also a driver of responding to violence in a peaceful manner. It's complicated. So I want to leave you with certain things that I want us to think about. One of the things that came from the West as a result of Cambridge Analytica was that you should delete Facebook. Get rid of it. Don't use Facebook. It's evil. It's going to kill you. Um, now the problem is that in, in Sri Lanka, in Myanmar, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, you can't delete Facebook. In Myanmar, they haven't heard of Google. They don't use email. In Myanmar, and Daniel knows this, because he's traveled to Yangon. If you go to Yangon, beautiful city, but crumbling, right? You go to 
to a little tea shop. It's in the middle of a bow tree. Right? So the tea shop is in the roots of the tree, with little stools on the roadside. It's not even a brick and mortar structure. And in that tree, you order a cup of tea and you drink it on that little stool by the roadside. It costs maybe 50 cents or whatever. But on a route, there is a little sign saying, like us on Facebook. Right? It's extraordinary. So Facebook is the internet. There's another story that I want to say, where a couple of years ago, a, a very serious academic institution went and asked people whether they, in, in Southeast Asia, including Myanmar, whether they use the internet. And everybody said, no, we don't use the internet. What is the internet? We don't know what the internet is. Oh, oh the people who knew about it said, no, it's too expensive. It, we can't afford it. We don't know, we, don't, we, can't, we can't read what's on it. It's too expensive. No, we don't use the internet. So, the response, the responses to whether you use the internet was really very low. The next question from the same person was, do you use Facebook? I said, yeah, I use Facebook every day. Yeah. So now, you know, it doesn't make sense because Facebook doesn't work without the internet. But there is no even cognitive comprehension that there is a world beyond Facebook. That is how ingrained it is into our lives. And you can't delete Facebook. There's not been anything like it. And now you have to deal with it. So that's what we are dealing with. The other thing is that, for example, many people say you should do what Germany did, or you should do what Australia did, or you should do what Singapore did, or you should do what now the United Kingdom is trying to do, or you should do what now the, uh, the United States of America is trying to do in terms of regulations and, and legal responses to the the, 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 the more disturbing elements of social media. The problem is that, I'm not, it's a longer conversation, but very simply put, the problem with regulation coming in from the Western imported into our countries is that tomorrow, if an authoritarian government comes into power, what does that regulation allow you to do? Complete silencing of dissent. Complete censorship. So the regulations that are introduced today for misinformation and fake news and ostensibly for the protection of civilians and citizens from this Democlean threat of social media can tomorrow, like we have in China, like we have in Singapore, like we have now in Australia, like we have now with Mr. Trump in the United States, lead to a very, very different scenario. So it's called a dual-use technology. Um, so regulation from the West and its simplistic importation must also be resisted. Fundamentally, and I think you've had this with Mr. Zuckerberg this year, La he, his entire life, Zuckerberg has laughed at privacy, publicly, publicly. His entire life, the company has kind of pushed back on any kind of regulation. And this year, he's in favor of both. Now, it remains to be seen what company does with it, but he's publicly said that he's in favor of privacy, and the company is going to pivot towards privacy, historically unprecedented. It's never happened before. We don't even know if I come to uh, Zurich next year, what Facebook is going to look like. It's a complete pivot. Uh, and now he's in favor of regulation as well. And I think that this is because, and again, I don't think that you should trust Mr. Zuckerberg, but it's because social media, the business model is not working. They're reaching a stagnation for the users who are signing up, apart from in China, and in parts of Africa where there's, there, are, there are large untapped markets, the rest of the markets are basically saturated. And the problem is that a lot of these markets, the conversation is not really very good. At scale. It's like Myanmar, it's like Sri Lanka. The companies have created platforms for toxicity. This is the law of unintended consequences. It's actually a law of unintended consequences. You have such a large growth with this facile expectation in Silicon Valley that everybody in this world, like, like most Swiss are, are Democrats. That is literally the foundation upon which these technologies have been built, and it's not true. So now you have historically unprecedented platforms for the manufacture, the spread, the promotion of toxicity and the companies don't know what to do with it, and they are now being held criminally culpable for it. That's a game changer.
They can no longer say, but you know, we are just a dumb punk. They are now being part of the problem. So then you have, as I said, this pivot to privacy, extraordinary. You have also uh, Dorsey from Twitter, you have now Google and YouTube, you have now Apple. Everybody, a few years ago, this conversation on privacy was very different. But now you have all these companies talking about privacy. And at the end of the day, this is part of our lives. You may, as Swiss, only go to Facebook or social media occasionally. My sister, who's older to me, is a home baker whose entire business is based on Instagram. So she can't live without Instagram. She can't do a business without Instagram. Our politicians, our political processes, our electoral processes, our referenda, our social uh, communications, our news and information, everything runs on social media, including mainstream media. The problem here is around how these companies deal with it. This is again where we get into AI. You can't deal with the amount of information that is being produced every second. There's no human oversight mechanism possible. So people often ask me, because Mr. Zuckerberg promised it, okay, so maybe you put more humans to oversee the content because you can't understand Sinhalese, you put more people who understand Sinhalese. So is it 100? Then you make it 200. Is it 200? Then you make it 500. Is it 500? Then you make it 1,000. You can't. It's not sustainable. It can't be done. There is, it's extraordinary. You haven't had this business problem before. No human collective can now oversee the content on these platforms. So what do you do? You have to have algorithms. And the problem with algorithms, I have demonstrated earlier. So there is no easy solution to this. In my country, you have what's called, it's an academic term, complex media ecology. Um, I don't know what it is like in Switzerland, but it's impossible to distinguish between social media and mainstream media in my country. It, you know, people read the newspaper on social media, people watch television on their handsets, people listen to radio when they're going to work, but not on the radio. Newspapers are declining in terms of print, but are increasing in terms of readership. Uh, and that is happening in a context where people, more and more people on the ground are also producing information. This is actually a, a, a specific domain of academic study. It's called complex media ecologies. It tries to contest the notion that social media is one thing, mainstream media is another. And that finally leads to what is called networked gatekeeping. This is a regulatory nightmare. Why? Because you haven't had companies like Facebook before. You had mainstream media, you had maybe a national level regulator, and then you had an audience. Today, these platforms are also the arbiters of what we read and how we read it and how we consume and how we engage with it, and as a consequence, how we see the world. If you don't see things that are on your news feed, did it really happen? It's like that old philosophical problem. If a tree fell in the forest and you didn't hear or see it, did it really fall? And this is a problem. So these companies now from Silicon Valley are determining algorithmically what we should and should not be consuming and we don't even know to ask what we are missing out on. So that is now what is called network gatekeeping. So finally, this is a quote from Shakespeare, from The Tempest. What's past is prologue. Is it the case that in the future, what we have seen up until 2019 is going to repeat itself? Or are these companies as a consequence of literally people dying, but also grasping the potential of what I have given you as examples of, that there is great value for these companies to be partial to democratic processes. Are they going to strengthen that? And I don't know what the answer to that is. It seems to be the case that they're interested in reducing the toxicity, but I don't think anybody has an answer around some of the problems easy answer at least around some of the problems that I have laid in front of you for your consideration this evening. Thank you very much. So thank you so much for this engaging and super interesting talk. In the interest of time, I think um, I also want to let you ask the question. So I think we're going to cut the um, on stage. Yes interview part because we've only 25 minutes left, but I would still ask the first question maybe to warm everyone up. So um, you mentioned a couple of times that you want to look at social media at scale. Now, 
would you have, after studying all this, some design features, for example, the word cloud or you know the network um, or other graphs you had, um, that you would tell Facebook, hey, please build this in, yeah. such that everyone can look at the entire population rather than their small box yeah. bubble. Yeah. So what are your design recommendations for Facebook? Well, there are two design recommendations that are many, but it's a long conversation. One is that, yes, you should have more user-level controls over the kind of content that you want to see. Right now, it's not easily um, adjustable, the degree to which um, you want to see specific kinds of content and then reduce the other types of content. It's algorithmically determined and not something that the user is fully in control around. So they are trying to build some of that in. The other thing, actually, is that the entire model of sharing has been built around what is called frictionless sharing. So it is a almost muscle memory to like to forward. And this is a problem now in India, for example, with WhatsApp, where the ability to forward it to hundreds resulted in rumor also spreading to hundreds. So uh, counterintuitively, what Silicon Valley is growing up to understand is that added friction helps improve the quality of the conversation and helps stem kind of rumor. Now, um, there are different ways that they do this, for example, in, in India, but now globally, they restrict the amount of people that you can forward it to at one go. Um, we want to build in either things that happen during violence or when there's a high proclivity of violence occurring, if you see that something has a very high probability, we want to tell Facebook in markets like mine, okay, do certain things that make it harder for people to share, because that's what they do without thinking and their media literacy is very poor and very low. So these are what you call UI elements or design elements. These are things that uh, you would do differently on the app. Uh, and there are maybe things that also show up differently. So if there's unverified information, it might have a particular label, for example. There's a whole range of things linked to human psychology as well that they're now trying to kind of experiment. But it's a larger conversation around Silicon Valley that didn't exist a few years ago um, that's going to impact their profit model. Because right now, the more sharing, the better it is for them. And a conversation at the end of the day that we are going to have is like less sharing, but maybe more quality. So you raise your hand and I'm going to hand you the mic, but I can also go on. I mean, I have a list of questions, but <laughs> I think we have a question. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much for your speech. It was very interesting and uh, uh, captivating. Uh, I have just a question regarding now you spoke about the company at Zuckerberg and other people and so on. When I look at the power they are getting through that, which they are, they, they, they didn't aim at the beginning. I mean, they were, I don't think that Mr. Zuckerberg thought that one day he will be so powerful. And now that they intervene, um, and here is my question, that we are intervening not only in the information, but also in the heart of our concept of the state. I mean, when, you are, when we speak about the, the model of the state which we have, where we have boundaries, geography, population, etc., Today we are over that, and these companies are not only feeding the information, but also are giving us the values. This is democratic, democratic value, you can spread it. This is terrorist, you cannot spread it, regardless of the quality, mm -hmm. and so on. How far it, has, it, it goes, and how it, will, it can be surviving with a, with a traditional model. two answers to that. One of the primary drivers of conflict in countries like Sri Lanka and Myanmar is as a consequence of a loss of identity. We think that a cosmopolitan, liberal, um, global identity, borderless world, for example, free travel, um, is good. What's counterintuitively happening as a consequence of more and more people getting connected on these platforms is that there is also 
entirely unexpectedly, in a sense, a growth of tribalism and tribal identity and communal identity. And in a country like Sri Lanka, where I can speak with some authority, there is a complete loss of knowing where one fits into in the future. The government is speaking in a language that I don't know where I fit in. I don't know where my community fits in. My, my loss of identity is real. Um, and that then drives me to an assertion of the identity to the exclusion of others. And this is then the basis of an othering and a violence and intercommunal fractures and fault lines that build on the past but find digital expression that leads to kinetic uh, reaction. So that is one, one, one answer. The other is that, um, you know, with Europe and the European Union and now with uh, America and uh, with the United Kingdom, all of these countries and regions and political entities, transnational or national in terms of sovereignty, are grappling with this phenomenon of these companies becoming more powerful than governments. I mean, Facebook has 2.2 billion people right? as, uh, as, as, as users in total, and I think what's called, but they have a metric called the MAU, monthly active users, that's well over 1.7 billion. That's more than the population of India. That's more than the population of China. So you haven't had these entities before. So philosophically, it's a problem. How do you, and, you know, deal with that? Uh, what is national sovereignty? What is a border? How do you regulate? How do you legislate? For example, uh, Sri Lanka has a very high diaspora. Now, you know, any country with a high diaspora, you know, they have sometimes very often a, a very you know, strong voice in what happens back in their home country, but they're in a different country. So, if these platforms both allow for it, but allow hate to be generated that has a a negative impact back home, but they are protected by free speech regulations and laws where they are producing it, then you have, maybe the lawyers in this room can explain this far more than I, a problem of jurisprudence. Right? I, there is no one answer to this, but I think that the regulatory conversations and the lawmaking um, is embracing this. Uh, and I think that you are also seeing a shift in the social media companies as well to embrace the power that they have Mr. Zuckerberg and uh, Sandy, um, I've been told I'll invite this, um, I know that we're running out of time, but, um, but, 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 but by people who are in Silicon Valley, they speak of Facebook as an extraordinary company that has never been like anything else before in the Valley. Because there's such a concentration of power with Zuckerberg and the higher echelons of management, that very often the company finds itself in a problem because the lower tiers or the middle management simply doesn't know what the high management is thinking. It, it, I mean, I mean that literally, they don't know, and I can give you some examples around it, but I think that is changing because they can't keep going on like this. Um, and I think this is why you have, at least cosmetically, I don't know whether it's going to be actually something that happens meaningfully, but at least cosmetically, this extraordinary, unprecedented interest now in regulation, in greater oversight, in independent oversight, and with the pivot to privacy. So it kind of goes back to your question. Maybe you, can, you don't need the mic, I can hear you. And the thing is, oh, oh, you're you're right, right, right. I won't have the question recorded. Right, right. I'm happy to repeat it, maybe. Yeah. Okay. During your speech, you never mentioned money and the influence of, of uh, powerful parties who may or may not influence the opinion yeah. by yeah. the way they, they yeah. buy opinions. Yeah. Okay, so the influence of power and money um, in these companies. Yes, so that's very evident, uh, both in Myanmar and in Sri Lanka. And philosophically, this is also the great debate where the internet was supposed to be liberating. Now you find that social media also with, you know, uh, from the time that, um, you know, the, the Tahrir Square and, you know, all of that euphoria at the time around the Middle East to now what we have today, post-Trump, post-Brexit. Um, so the, the tables have turned and what you find as a consequence is that the, the, the people who are entrenched already in political authority and power are the ones who are probably the greatest users of social media to be in power. Uh, so in my part of the world, for example, you have, I mean, this is a longer conversation, a very interesting question, but both the overt um, uh, investment, so what you can see in terms of political advertising, 
uh, but you would see uh, in terms of during electoral campaign what would come up on a news feed or what would be presented to you as a as a campaign advertisement and what you don't see which is actually the more dangerous one uh, so at scale that I look at uh, there's something called a dark signature where you don't know who the producer or the author or the funder is but the entirety of the account, what it's saying, how it's saying it, what it's using, the time it's putting it out, is all towards a particular ideology or a particular individual or a particular party. And it's happening in concert, it's happening collaboratively, it's happening more than coincidence. Right? So that is what you're seeing. I can see, I can literally see it. I can't ascribe it. But you know that somebody who's obviously aligned with that ideology or that party and wants that party to succeed electorally is funding it. Maybe from the party, maybe outside. You don't know. Now you can find out, but it's in forensically, digitally, very, very difficult. That is what we are now finding. So the kind of things that now the West is going through, we are finding in our part of the world as well. In fact, our part of the world prefigured a lot of the things that we told Facebook in 2014 and 2013 came to haunt the company, but only when it came from more mature markets and Western democracies. They didn't listen to us because we were too small, we were too insignificant. But we saw these patterns in our part of the world as well. It is a problem. It's called inauthentic behavior. And just today, Facebook has taken away several accounts, several large clusters of accounts in Africa. Uh, in Chad, in Niger, and other parts of, of Africa around this specific activity. Did it in India during the parliamentary elections, and it might be the case in Sri Lanka as well. I'm not in a position to speak about that openly, but you know, Facebook is concerned that this kind of pattern is there. It is going to be uh, the case in the future. It is going to grow. It's not going to go away. It's going to be more difficult. And let me tell you that it's going to require a complete revision in electoral law and regulation and frameworks, which is what India did to encompass this, this new vector, this new challenge, and this new threat, in a sense, to electoral systems, frameworks, and processes. And also from my side, thank you very much for the super interesting uh, input. Um, so I was wondering, since you talked about how um, AI and ITCs are sort of enabling technologies that can um, accelerate um, the spread of violence, do um, you think that the same kind of mechanism also applies to technology and conflict uh, resolution? Um, I mean, you know, in terms of the scale, scope and speed, or would you say that the tech and peace nexus follows a sort of different logic. Mm. Mm. Well, I think that it's eternally going to be in contest with the contenders who create the context for the violent, um, uh, for the violence to grow. And it's always been the case. I mean, I don't think that we've gone, I think we've gone beyond that simplistic belief that the mere introduction of social media is going to help uh, democratic actors or peace builders do their work better in contexts of violence. And, you know, linked to what the gentleman asked me, but you're increasingly finding that state level actors and non state actors and dark actors and sometimes foreign actors are sometimes the most adroit, the most adept at using social media to promote, to produce, and to spread violence. Um, I'll tell you frankly what my frustration is. My frustration is, and this is the raison d'etre of the foundation since its inception, is to, is to alert, strengthen, and create the capacity of civil society to liberate this damn thing. It's all there. The potential is there. The frustration is that they don't do what they can be doing either through a lack of knowledge or a lack of interest or the belief that it's not important. In my, in my country, my endeavor still is, in some circles, and including in government, at the highest levels, to convince them that this is important, this is absurd. The people who are using it know how important it is, but uh, you know, different sections of society still don't, including civil society. So that is the frustration, that is what, in a sense, compels me and drives me through, uh, to, 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 to explain by data some of what I have been saying for many years, because they can dismiss me, but if I tell them that, look, you're a bloody idiot, 
because there's data points at scale in the millions that suggest that this is what you should be doing, or this is what you should be responding to, or this is how you should be saying it, or this is the platform you should be using, or this is the expression, or this is the content, or this is the frame, or this is the cartoon, or this is the length of the video, or this is the kind of caption that you, sh you should be using on the photo, or this is the time of day, of week, of month that you should be putting this up, or this is what that person is saying and this is what you should be saying it to count it, or this is what that person could be saying at that time over this person, who is a candidate at that election, and because of that you should be start, uh, starting to say what you should be doing now. So it's like a cat and mouse game, strategy. If this can be embraced by civil society, then I think there will be a very different discussion around peace building. That is, our, that is our hope and that is our endeavor, at least from the Foundation's perspective and mine personally. Thanks. Um, <coughs> You know, one thing I wondered, you said, well, there, there was no way that Facebook could get a handle on um, this rapid spread of these violent videos uh, yeah. like that. Look, yeah. I mean, it, it sort of reminded me of things that happen when, when there's a big run on the stock market, for example. Mm. They close it down. Mm. They just say, look, things have gotten out of control. Mm. Everybody's gone nuts. We're closing the stock market. Pumped. Yeah. Oh. And, I mean, there have been times when all this stuff went down because it just crashed from some problem, you know, and then I, you know, I, I don't pay that much attention to it, but I read about it afterwards, I say, oh, well, you know, nobody had what's that for, for a day and a half, and the world did not end. I mean, wouldn't it be possible in some of these things just say, okay, it's out of control, that's it, you yeah. lost it, boom, done. So that's what the Sri Lankan government tried to do. They tried it three times from the 21st of April, from the 21st to the 30th, of, uh, 28th of April, all social media except Twitter was blocked. Then again, beginning of May, and then again last week. Three times, the largest, the longest block was nine days, then it was about three days, and then it was 48 hours. So three times, exactly for the reasons that you mentioned, the Sri Lankan government uh, blocked, including the last time Twitter as well. The problem is, it doesn't work. And it's not me saying it, it's because I research it and we have the data now, including from last year. In my part of the world, the moment, and I, I don't have the graph in this presentation, but I do have the data, the moment that a block is announced, VPN searches go up like this. Remember that, uh, again, statistically, of the 7 million uh, in Sri Lanka and the nearly 25 million in Myanmar, 96, 97% of all Facebook and social media users use it over their smartphone, right? Um, and what happened now is as a consequence of the blocks being arbitrarily or suddenly imposed, uh, Google is not blocked, so they, the VPN searches go up and VPNs are installed and social media happens. So there is data that suggests that, I mean, I, this is part of my work actually, that the, the thousand accounts I look at had an imperceptible drop in engagement, even at the height of the, the block officially. And generally the traffic fell down, but the the platforms and the accounts that were kind of central to um, the conversations in the country didn't notice but any block at all. No, the government turned it off. Facebook does other things. It doesn't turn it off, but um, algorithmically it increases friction. It um, there are there are countries like Sri Lanka and Myanmar, which I don't know what they exactly call it, but we are on a high alert list. So. Uh, they look at the kind of conversational domain and sometimes even before I can see, they say like, look here, there are rumors going around and then they consult with local country level actors, including those like myself and say, what is the proclivity? They call it imminent harm. That's that imminent harm framework. Um, Twitter has a framework called CRANE, the Crisis Response and Natural Emergency uh, Framework. These are all frameworks of uh, things that the company is going to do when a, a crisis could be actually a tsunami, for example, and not necessarily be political violence. What, what is it going to do? Now, all of that is also in operation, but let me end by saying that in a country like ours, you see the challenge is Twitter needs and Facebook needs an, an official interlocutor. It needs to work with government. Two problems. Sometimes the government is the problem in our country. They are the primary producers of information, so then what do you do? Secondly, and I'm not making this up, Right? And I can speak about it openly, even though it's been recorded, because it's actually happened. When Facebook came to Sri Lanka after the suicide attacks on Easter Sunday, 
to help the government deal with misinformation, they had a two-hour meeting with my president. One hour of that meeting was spent with the president initially and then his emissaries and officials talking to Facebook about two things. One was a website that the president didn't like and wanted to read. I'm not making this stuff up. Second, the president of my country, and I take no great pleasure in saying this, wanted Facebook to stop the distribution of SMSs. Now, Facebook was so taken aback that the report that they sent to Menlo Park wasn't believed. I love my country. There are some of us who have made and will make great sacrifices to make sure it doesn't go through cycles of violence. But the problem we have is that we are dealing with individuals in power and authority who don't understand the basics of technology. So I'm not trying to exonerate Facebook and social media yeah, companies. Yeah, I know, I know. I don't want to speak about other countries because that's not my place or position. I can speak critically about my own and allow the audience to take lessons and extrapolate from that. And I know exactly what we are thinking about as well. But, you know, this is the problem and the challenge we have. So I'm not trying to exonerate social media companies, but um, I'll tell you an anecdote of a company employee, and he's Sri Lankan. He said, listen, we grew up with war. Do you think, Mr. President, that we want our technology to be associated with an, the start of another conflict? Do you really believe that? So sometimes good people in these companies are also there, but they're thwarted by, as I said, the upper echelons of management who come from a very different context and culture. So it's a complicated answer, technically as well as regulatory. So let me ask a final question. Um, you've now explained basically what Facebook and social media can do for good, basically speaking truth to power and also outline all the problems. Now, um, what can we do to basically bring about more of the good and maybe, you know, tune down on the bad stuff Given that we live in Switzerland, given that social media doesn't play the same role that it does, for example, in Sri Lanka, like if you have a message to um, like a call for action, is there one or is this more about informing us and so we know what's going on? I hate questions like that. <laughs> because that makes me into this kind of prophet who wants to tell something that the flock then takes forward and does with it as it's very biblical and Christian. Um, listen, at the end of the day, you are all very privileged. You are incredibly privileged to be studying here, to be living here, to come here to, as I am. Every time I get through the border in Zulu Capital, I think, wow, this is so cool. I'm in Switzerland. It's an incredible privilege that I never forget because I come from a very, very different context. And I go back to that context. Um, and one of the things that you can do is to create the space for the conversations that cannot occur in my part of the world to happen here so that it informs those across the Atlantic. So the Swiss voice sometimes can augment and complement and strengthen uh, if it is fertilized by voices from the global south so that you are our ambassadors, you are our emissaries to communicate to your interlocutors across the, across the sea that this is what we are seeing in the countries, in the context of the communities and the peoples we're talking about. Secondly, I think it is also to kind of spread models of media literacy. Uh, Finland, for example, has done a lot uh, as a consequence of the threat of Russian misinformation to include media literacy programs in, in schools, you know, starting with school children. This is something that we have been asking our government to do, and it's very low tech at the end of the day. But it's fundamentally important to teach our children, to teach from that level upwards and to create a generation where it's not about YouTube or Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever, because these technologies and these platforms may not be there five years down the line, but the media literacy around critical consumption and questioning of what you read and consume so that you don't react and respond to the content immediately through muscle memory, I think, is fundamentally important. If you can create those models and you know, serve it up as a template for the rest of us to emulate, um, maybe that's something that you could do. Thank you so much.